Yeah. Just look All right. Um, I'd like to call the Winter Flounder Management Board to order. As with the herring section, um, my name is Bob Beal. I'm the executive director of ASMSC. The Winter Flounder Management Board finds itself with no chair and vice chair at this time due to similar circumstances in that there's been retirements and other issues that have uh, prevented those folks from serving that were previously elected. So I will kick off the meeting and move through the agenda all the way up through the election of chair and vice chair, and then the newly elected chair will take over uh, the meeting from, from that point on. Um, with that, there has been an agenda distributed in the briefing materials. Any changes or additions to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. Um, we have a series of minutes from about a year ago. For, so January of 2017 is the last time this board has met. Are there any uh, changes or adjustments to those minutes from uh, the, the last meeting of the board? David Pierce. Yes, on uh, page two of the minutes, uh, first column about the fourth paragraph down, uh, there's, a, there's a sentence that reads, in terms of considering changes to our state's waters, acidification. I think that's supposed to be specifications, so just uh, a change in that would be useful. Thank you, David. Somebody appeared to be overly worried about ocean acidification, was trying to get it in there as much as they could. <clears throat> All right, we will make that change. Any other adjustments to the minutes from January 2017? All right, seeing none, those, most, or those proceedings stand approved. Public comment. Any public comment for items that are not included on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll keep moving forward. Agenda item number four is election of a chair and vice chair for the Winter Flounder Management Board. Any nominations? Pat Kelleher. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, after a lot of deliberation, um, I would like to uh, nominate the only person in the room who read the minutes of the Winter Flounder meeting, um, uh, uh, David Pierce from the Commonwealth of uh, Massachusetts for chair, uh, and from the uh, great little state of Rhode Island, David Borden for vice chair. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Is there a second to those nominations? Richie White, thank you. Um, we have nominations before the board, uh, David Pierce as chair, David Borden as vice chair. Are there any objections to the approval of these two nominations for the leadership of this management board? Seeing none, congratulations, David and David. Good luck. And now I will step down. Well, thank you, everyone. I started my career working on winter flounder back in 1972. My career is not yet over, but nevertheless, it's nice to get back to, to winter flounder in a meaningful way. So we've uh, covered everything on the agenda up to this particular point. Next on the agenda, we have a review of the 2017 groundfish operational stock assessment uh, for Gulf of Maine as well as southern New England mid-Atlantic winter flounder stocks. And, Paul uh, Nitschke is going to provide that, uh, that review for us. Uh, if you would, Paul. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Paul Nitschke. I'm chair of the Winter Flounder TC. Uh, I work in population dynamics in Woods Hole. I also have the lead on the Gulf of Maine Winter Flounder assessment. And I'm also the pop dive rep on the groundfish PDT. Um, first, I want to go through the, a little bit of the process that the center is trying to do with the operational assessments. Um, we're planning on trying to do these assessments, these operational assessments every two years um, so that we rely less on projections. We have uh, learned from the past that relying on old projections hasn't worked too well. Uh, the projections tend to be overly optimistic and biased high. And we've gotten burnt from that in the past. And so now the plan is to update the assessments more often, rely less on the projections. So in doing this, we do these operational assessments. Um, they're not full benchmark assessments. However, there is a review component uh, to these operational assessments also. 
So we do all 20, 19 to 20 stocks every two years for ground fish. Um, we did them, last time we did them was in, uh, in last summer and the review was in September. Uh, the, the other initiative is to do this efficiency initiative um, to make the assessments more automatic, put all the information online and it's for everyone to see it's more of a transparent process. All the figures and tables are online on this data portal at this website. Um, the figures and tables are updated. There's the model inputs and outputs, diagnostics, maps from the surveys, maps from the commercial fisheries. Um, there's a lot of information on the data portal. So for the operational assessments, uh, we have these generic terms of reference. Um, there are some restrictions on changes that can be made in order to get through all 20 stocks in one week. Um, so for the last round, we basically updated the data. So we added two years of information uh, to the analytical models. We run the models and estimate the stock size and fishing mortality rates update the biological reference points, evaluate stock status, um, estimate the overfishing limits and catch advice coming out of those models. And of course we have a uh, source of uncertainty and research recommendation. Um, there's also plan B developed in case the models don't pass peer review. So there's something to fall back on um, if, they, if they fail that review. Uh, this time around we had some information on catchability. This came from some cooperative research work that was uh, recently done. Uh, this information was used as a diagnostic in the analytical models um, and for some of the empirical assessments it was used directly in the estimates. So as I've said, there's some um, things we don't change. We don't change the life history, uh, such as the natural mortality rates, selectivity, uh, weightings in the model. Um, we don't tr try to change. I haven't changed in the past. Um, we retain this uh, rule for the retrospective, which was developed at GARM 3, basically doing a retrospective adjustment. Um, if if the um, Mons row is outside of the, the 90 percent confidence intervals of the model. However, this didn't apply to uh, the winter ponder stocks. Okay, so first up, I'm going to go through the Gulf of Maine uh, winter flounder operational assessment. I have the lead on this uh, stock. This was last updated at the 2015 operational assessments. Uh, the benchmark is in 2011 at SARC 52. Uh, this is an em empirical approach based on 30 plus uh, survey area swept estimates. So the Gulf of Maine with the stock, uh, the stock status is uh, overfished is unknown and overfishing is not occurring. Uh, the Gulf of Maine stock was historically the smallest of the three winter flounder stocks and it's concentrated in inshore waters in Mass Bay and Cape Cod Bay mostly, north of Cape Cod. So for, this is, the analytical assessment did not pass peer review at GARM 3. It also did not pass peer review again at SARC 52, um, basically due to a very large retrospective pattern. Uh, we tried looking at different models. We looked at the VPA scale model, the ASAP model, other statistical catch age models, but they all have this uh, real major conflict uh, within the data. Basically, the models can't handle this lack of a relationship between the large decrease in the catch over the time series with little change in the indices and age structure over time. So now the assessment is basically just based on the straight 30 plus area swept biomass which comes directly from the surveys. Um, for the operational assessments we, all, we do update the trends um, just to keep an eye on them. 
So there's updated trends for the, the uh, NIMPH survey, mass DMF survey, and the Maine New Hampshire surveys. Uh, for this round, we est estimated the catch uh, for 2015 with a terminal year of 2016. Um, the catch is comprised of the commercial landings, recreational landings, recre recreational discards, large mesh trawl discards, and the gillnet discards. So you can see here there's a large uh, change in the landings over the time series from the 1980s. Um, there's been a large reduction at, at, at the end of the time series, you're around 5%. Uh, of what the landings were in the 1980s. Uh, most of the landings is coming from the state of Massachusetts and from the trawl fishery. Uh, in the past, about 20% or so came from the gillnet fishery. Here's the total removals uh, for the Gulf of Maine stock. Uh, the recreational component was significant in the 1980s. Um, that pretty much disappeared um, in the 19, early 1990s and remains a very minor component of the removals. And once again, you can see that large decline in that catch series. Here are the trends in the raw survey indices. And you can, on top is the NIMS surveys, in the, on, in the middle is the Mass DMF survey, spring and fall, and on the bottom is the Maine, New Hampshire spring and fall surveys. The surveys tend to be relatively flat over the entire time series. Um, the Mass DMF spring surveys shows perhaps a slight decline over the time series. However, the Maine, New Hampshire spring survey shows a little bit of an increasing trend. So now the, the, the assessment's based on just the area swept from the surveys. The issue with, Gulf, with winter flounder is we don't have a survey that covers the entire stock. So we basically use three different surveys with non-overlapping strata to try to cover the stock. We use the, the NIMP survey to cover the offshore strata and strata in Mass Bay and Cape Cod Bay. The mass DMF survey is used for the very shallow strata um, in Cape Cod Bay and Mass Bay. Uh, those strata are very small. However, um, there are very large catches in those strata. Uh, north, north of Massachusetts, we used the uh, Maine, New Hampshire survey. Uh, this is a large area. However, very few 30-plus uh, centimeter fish are caught in that survey. So here are the uh, numbers that go into that expansion. On the top is the survey area. Um, then we have the, the footprint for each survey, which produces that its expansion factor. This is the length frequency distribution from the Maine, New Hampshire survey. That survey does catch uh, a lot of fish. However, from these length frequency distributions, you can see that very few 30 plus fish are caught, 30 centimeter plus fish are caught in that survey. So here's the basic equation uh, for exploitable biomass. It's just simply the 30 plus uh, biomass index multiplied by this expansion factor, which is the total survey area, area divided by the total footprint times Q. Now Q here you can think of as the efficiency of the gear itself. Um, it's an important assumption, and the results are sensitive to that estimate or that assumption of Q. Um, so for exportation rates, it's just simply the catch over the 30 centimeter plus biomass. And for, for, for Gulf of Maine window flounder, we developed uh, biological reference points based on F40 from a length-based yield per crude analysis which had the same um, life history assumptions that went into the uh, 30 plus area swept. So we used a 30 plus centimeter knife edge selectivity in that yield per crude analysis and a natural mortality rate of 0.3. This produced a FMSY exportation rate of 0.23. 
75% uh, of that value is 0.17, which was used for determining the ABC. So at SARC 52, the, we had very little information on what that Q should be in this empirical approach. Uh, at that time, we had a range of different Q assumptions, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. Um, the SARC 52 review panel basically picked the 0 0.6 assumption based on some information on the Georges Pank Winter Flounder VPA at that time. However, now we have uh, some um, experimental information on efficiency from the Bigelow from Winter Flounder. Um, that estimated, estimated Q, average estimated Q came out to 0.866 and was used for this assessment. So we basically used the average of the fall uh, survey queues to come up with that 0.866 uh, um, value, which was used for all three surveys. Acknowledging the fact that um, the different surveys have different gear types. So the, the experiment basically looked at the efficiency of the Bigelow net, which is on the left here. The Bigelow uses a uh, roller gear so that the survey can uh, sample different habitat types. Uh, for this work, we want to look at the efficiency of flatfish. So we compared the catch rates um, from the Bigelow, from the Bigelow net versus a flat, flatfish net. Um, the flatfish net, flat net was a state-of-the-art uh, net for catching flatfish, had, uh, had a chain, thick chain for the foot rope instead of the roller gear and tended bottom very closely. These are the results that came out for winter flounder that came out of that comparison between the chain sweep and the rock hopper gear uh, at different lengths and for day and night toes. Um, at, n at night, you can see there was very little difference actually in the efficiency between the two different gear types. Uh, during the day, um, there was a difference with the chain sweep catching uh, more fish than the, than the Bigelow gear. So we, use, we only used a 30 plus uh, centimeter difference here. which produced this uh, 0.87 Q assumption. Um, so these are the results coming out of that uh, calculation for all the different surveys. On the bottom is the fall survey and on top is the spring survey. Uh, the different colors represent the different surveys that go into that total estimate for the um, biomass. At SAR 52, um, the decision was made to use the fall survey because there were, there were concerns that in the spring we could be missing, f missing fish uh, due to spawning within the estuaries where there no surveys, no survey information. However, as we update this, uh, these estimates, you can see that the estimate, the total estimates for the spring and fall are pretty similar now. Uh, there's not, not, not a lot of difference between the two. So the arrows here signify what data is used in determining the actual catch advice. So w when we update the assessments every two years, we basically use every other year for that catch advice. So you can see here from 2014 to 2016 that that uh, total estimate does decrease uh, between those two years. So that contri contributes to the reduction in the ABC for this stock. The other contributing, big contributing factor to the reduction is the change in the Q assumption. That basically results in a 30% reduction in the, in the catch advice. So here are the exportation rates coming out of the spring and fall surveys, um, producing very similar trends and relatively low ex exportation rates 
over time. Here's the biomass trend from this method uh, for the Bigelow years. Um, one of the puzzling uh, results of this is we have this declining biomass trend. However, the exploitation rates are low and far below the overfishing definition. So it's not clear why the stock is not responding to the low exploitation rates. So another way of looking at, the, at this um, stock status plot, you can see here the, the biomass is, tends to be declining under these low exploitation rates. So one of the major sources of uncertainty is the Q. Um, there was a review of the sweep study um, there, were, there was some concern about sample size for winter flounder in that study. Uh, so more information on, on that, estimating that Q um, would give us more confidence in the area swept estimates. And also more studies on the state surveys because they used a different gear type. Another comment was to um, perhaps produce more stable uh, catch advice coming out of this method by using multiple years or multiple surveys. Uh, there's quite a bit of interannual variability uh, in the estimates and doing, doing some sort of moving average would per perhaps stabilize that catch advice. So as I've said, uh, one of the major concerns is why isn't this stock uh, responding to the low exploitation rates? And a general concern is the fact that this, this method, you can't get a biomass uh, status out of it. So the PDT produces these, um, we call them catch performance plots. Um, we produce these plots for the SSC to consider for all the ground fish stocks. Uh, here you can see we put on the, uh, the recent catches, uh, compare that to the historical OFLs and, and ABCs uh, that came into play in 2010. Um, then there's the catch assumption for the analytical models. This is the catch assumption used in the projections themselves for the bridge year. And then in 2018, 19, and 20, you can see the, the updated estimates coming out of the new assessment. You can compare that to the results from the past and you can see how that changes. So here you can see the, the black line, which was the historical ABCs compared to the updated uh, ABCs, which is that blue line. So there's a pretty big reduction in that catch advice. The yes, no on the x-axis represents the um, overfishing status at, in the terminal year of past assessments. I also included just the straight numbers from that plot if people are interested in seeing the actual numbers and the changes in those numbers. So for this one, the OFL is simply based on that FMSY estimate multiplied by the 30 plus centimeter um, area swept estimate, and the ABC is 75% of that value. So the OFL was calculated at 596 metric tons, and the ABC was 447 metric tons, which is held constant for the three years. Um, I can take questions on Gulf of Maine, or I can go into southern New England if you want. Let's uh, work off of the Gulf of Maine for now. Any uh, questions for Paul regarding the operational assessment for Gulf of Maine winter flounder? Uh, David Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Paul, have you ever, <coughs> excuse me, um, plotted the uh, rise in the seal population in the Gulf of Maine versus the uh, population of winter flounders? See if there's a correlation between the two. I keep reading all these news releases from various sources talking about there being 
you know, dramatic increases north of the Cape. So uh, is there a relationship here? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a dramatic increase in the seal population. I don't know how many survey numbers we have. We, we do know there's a large increase in that population, especially also it affects the Southern England stock. Maybe even more important for the Southern England stock. <laughs> with the gray seal explosion on Cape Cod. Other questions for Paul? Uh, I have one, Paul. Uh, you indicated in your presentation that the value of Q, the catchability coefficient, was derived from commercial vessel experiments. Am I correct? Okay. All right, so you came up with those Q values from those experiments using a two different types of nets, right? One with rock hoppers and one with chains, chain sweeps? Right, so the, it was on a twin trawl, fishing both nets at the same time. One net was the exact Bigelow net, and the other net was an efficient flatfish net. Okay, and then those Q values that you determined from those experiments were applied to the catches by the Bigelow, is that correct? Right, so if we assume the flat net is 100% efficient, we get some idea of the relative difference between those two gear types. And that difference was applied to the Bigelow for the area swept. Okay, apl applied to the Bigelow catches, but you mentioned that the Bigelow doesn't catch, I'm paraphrasing a bit, the Bigelow is not, doesn't do a very great job catching winter flounder because of the size of the vessel and whatever, whatever factors. So. Uh, how does that factor into the application of the Q value from those experiments to the Bigelow catches themselves? Shouldn't the Q value be much lower for the Bigelow because of the size of the vessel and uh, the fact that it doesn't catch much winter flounder? So originally when we, when we did this approach, we assumed a Q of 0.6. Now with the updated information, we now think that was too low. We think it's higher. We think actually think the, for winter flounder, it looks like the Bigelow was more efficient than we thought. So the higher the Q value, the lower the biomass overall? Correct. Okay. So the new Q value is higher than what it was. Okay. Uh, well, with that said, I'll just offer one additional piece of information we got in the Q value. Uh, this coming spring, May, uh, the, the Division of Marine Fisheries will be spending three to five trips devoted to um, uh, work on a fishing vessel with, uh, with nets to um, get a better understanding of, uh, of, the, of the Q value for, you know, for, for the net that we are using in our bottom trawl survey for the Gulf of Maine cod, uh, cod survey and the herding effect. That's what we're looking into. So, so the board, we, uh, we may be later on this year, be looking at some additional additional information relative to the Q values. It doesn't affect this year's information, but uh, maybe maybe down the road. All right, no other questions for, um, for Paul on the Gulf of Maine. Uh, operational assessment, let's get into the Southern New England Mid-Atlantic. Okay, Southern New England Mid-Atlantic. Um, the lead scientist for this stock is Tony Wood. Um, like the Gulf of Maine, this was last assessed in 2015 at the operational assessments. Uh, the benchmark was also in 2011 at SARC 52. So the Southern New England set, uh, stock was historically the largest of the three winter flounder stocks. Uh, this assessment does have an analytical model, a statistical catch age model. Um, the ASAP model with ages 1 to 7 plus and year, spanning years from 1981 to 2016. So for the catch at age, the commercial landings, commercial discards, recreational landings and recreational discards are in the catch at age. For the commercial discards, we assume a 50% mortality rate. And for the recreational discards, we assume a 15% mortality rate. This was also true in the Gulf of Maine stock. So like the Gulf of Maine stock, there's a very large reduction in the removals over time. 
uh, from the 1980s, uh, the terminal year was less than 4% of the removals that occurred in the early 1980s. Uh, the 2016 uh, estimated catch was 679 metric tons. And like the Gulf of Maine stock, the recreational uh, component was significant in the, in the early 80s. However, the recreational component has uh, decreased and remains a pretty minor component of the removals. Oh, I forgot to mention, in 20, as the output control system came on board with Amendment 16 uh, in, in 2009, this stock um, became a no possession stock from 2009 to into 2013. Um, that no possession stock did result in uh, into, into a change of those fish that would, would have been landed into discards. So it, it also creates some uncertainty in the assessment because we assume this 50% mortality rate on the discards. Uh, puts more pressure on that mortality rate because a greater proportion of the removals is now um, assumed to be discarded. So j with a zero possession trip limit, um, mortality is still occurring and it's, it's not clear whether the mortality rates were or whether the catch truly was much lower during those uh, zero possession days compared to more recently. This can be seen in the proportion uh, of the removals. You can see where that uh, trip limit came in, into, into effect in 29, uh, where a greater proportion of the removals um, was discarded. So the catch at age is mostly comprised of uh, age three and four fish. Uh, the mean weights at age are relatively constant for this stock over the time series. Now, for, for many of the ground fish stocks, we have large declines in the mean weights at age at the end of the time series. Uh, we don't see evidence of that uh, with this stock. This assessment uses many different uh, surveys, uh, does many different indices of abundance. We have the the NIMS spring and winter and fall surveys, um, the Mass DMS spring survey, the Rhode Island spring survey, Connecticut spring, New Jersey oceans and rivers, um, URI GSO survey, and there's two younger year recruitment surveys, the Mass DMS survey and the Connecticut uh, survey. All the surveys show very similar trends. We, we see this declining uh, trend in abundance over the entire time series. So all the survey information um, agrees with those trends where we have um, low, low estimates in the survey abundance at the end of the time series. So these are the trends for the, the center spring, fall, winter, and mass DMF spring surveys. Um, here's a comparison for the state surveys, Rhode Island Spring, Connecticut Spring, New Jersey Oceans and New Jersey Rivers, and the URI GSO survey. Um, these surveys are near record lows at the end of the time series. For the age zero indices, um, the, the Connecticut survey is showing very low um, Recruitment at the end of the time series, the mass DMF survey is showing a little bit more of a flattening out of that survey trend at the end. Now that NEA map survey wasn't part of the benchmark assessment at that time. Um, I'm showing this here uh, because I think there were some questions about this survey last time I was given this talk. Um, however, keep in mind this survey is not in the stock assessment. Uh, so for the spring, for the spring survey, you can see the, the green is the strata that go into that index, the green strata, um, which is a larger area than the fall strata that goes into the index 
the, the fall strata are basically concentrated in that Rhode Island, uh, long, in the Long Island area because most of the fish are offshore in, during the fall. So here are the trends in the NEOMAP survey. Um, overall, I don't think the trends disagree with what's coming out of the stock assessment. Um, fairly flat over this time series. Uh, in the spring, there was an increase in 2016 in the survey. However, in the fall index, we didn't see that increase in, the, in 2016. And perhaps the fall survey is showing a little bit more of a declining trend. So for, for the biology, we assume an M of 0.3, and the maturity schedule comes from the Mass DMF spring survey, which came out of SARC 52, using the entire time series. These are the selectivity, uh, estimated selectivities from the commercial side in the model. Uh, one of the concerns is as we update this model, the second block seems to be becoming more dome shaped as we, as we add data. Um, and there's some concern about a buildup of cryptic biomass uh, in the model. Because we have dome shaped selectivities on the commercial side, we also estimate uh, dome shaped selectivity on the, on the indices themselves. However, the indices, the selectivity doesn't change as much um, as we update, and update the model with more data. They, they don't seem to be changing as much as the, on the commercial side. So here are the trends in the total biomass and SSB and exploitable biomass. Um, there's this declining trend in all the biomass estimates. And here you can see that effect of the dome-shaped selectivity when you compare the, the SSB trends and the explo exploitable biomass trends. You're seeing that flip over at the end of the time series where this cryptic biomass is creeping into the model. There was a retrospective pattern in this assessment. Uh, however, it wasn't severe enough to warrant a retrospective adjustment in the projections. So for the stock status, this stock started out um, with, a, with high biomass and high fishing mortality rates, which drove the stock down to um, low biomass and high fishing mortality rates. However, now, in the last nine years, uh, we haven't been overfishing this stock. Um, however, there's not any uh, evidence of rebuilding biomass, even if, the, even if we weren't overfishing in the last nine years. So the stock doesn't seem to be responding to these low fishing mortality rates. On this plot, you can see where the retrospective adjustment, which is that red dot, it's within that blocks, which is the 90% confidence intervals in the terminal year of the model. So no adjustment was made. Here's the change in the biological reference po points from 2015 to 2017. FMSY increased from 0.33 to 0.34. SSB MSY decreased from 27,000 metric tons to about 25,000 metric tons. So these are part of the standardized um, plots coming out of the, the standardized assessment models from the operational assessments. Um, on the left is the spawning stock biomass trend. Uh, the solid line is the updated model, the dashed line is the previous model, and the shaded area is the 90% confidence intervals around the updated model. So for southern England uh, winter flounder, the biomass decreased quickly um, below the overfish threshold and has remained below the overfish threshold for uh, several decades. 
And the, the issue now is it appears the biomass is actually going in the wrong direction where it's actually decreasing at the end of the time series. Despite the fact that fishing mortality rates are below the overfishing threshold at the end of the time series. And this is mainly due to this large decline in the estimated recruitment over the time series. Um, there's a little bit of an increase at the end of the time series. Um, rem remains uncertain whether this uh, increase will continue or if this will change in updated models. Because we don't see a lot of evidence of increases in recruitment in the survey indices themselves. So the biological reference points for this stock are based off a stock recruit relationship with a fixed steepness. Uh, one of the issues uh, in particular for this stock is the points at the end of the time series all fall below the stock recruit relationship. So when we look at the residual pattern over time, you can see it in this plot where all the um, residuals are on the negative side indicating that if you did long-term projections that you would over, likely overestimate the recruitment going into those projections. This is another reason not to use um, long-term projections for this stock. Here are the trends in the abundance at age over time. You can see how that uh, change in recruitment, how that changes the age structure through time, um, you notice at the end of the time series, this is the building up in the proportions of the plus group. You can see that in the proportion graph on the, on the right. This is perhaps more evident when we look at this in terms of spawning stock biomass, where you see at the end of the time series, we have this building up of the plus group, which a proportion of that plus group is cryptic biomass, which the fishery nor the surveys can catch. So that building up of the cryptic biomass is a, a source of uncertainty. Um, the natural mortality rate is also, has also been questioned as a source of uncertainty. The fixed steepness in the stock recruit, recruit relationship is uh, concern and there's also some, we're also not getting a lot of length information from the recreational side, mainly due to the fact that the recreational fishery is so small now. And of course the retrospective pattern is always a, a source of uncertainty. So here's the catch performance plots um, that the PDT developed for Southern England Winter Flounder. Here you can see the, um, the estimated catch is closer to the ABCs, unlike um, for the Gulf of Maine where there was a large difference between those two. Uh, more recently, you can see that the updated assessment and the updated projections coming out of that assessment show a, a slight increase in the ABCs from those projections. So comparing that black line to the blue line. We have the numbers that go into that plot. However, the, when the SSC looked at this information, there was um, concern about the cryptic biomass and the stock recruit relationship, and the projections were not used for catch advice. Basically, the ABCs were determined using average catch from 2014 to 2016, which produced an ABC of 727 metric tons. The OFLs were still based on FMSY projections at 2018, and that number, the 1228 metric tons, was held constant for three years. And I can take questions on Sun New England. Right, thank you, Paul. Uh, you know, board members, this is the assessment uh, presented to the New England Fishery Management Council, reviewed by the plan development team. 
uh, certainly critiqued by the SNS committee, and then uh, it all resulted in the establishment of an OFL, OFL as well as the ABC, and then the catch limits. And, and specific for this group today, this board, are the subcomponents, uh, the state waters subcomponents, which we'll get into very shortly. Discussion about those components and how we should react to those new numbers. Uh, so, with that said, are there any uh, questions of Paul uh, regarding this assessment? All right, uh, I see none. There is definitely a lot to digest for sure. If, uh, if there's no objection, I'm going to uh, skip over number six, which is discuss potential management responses to the operational assessment, potential action. We're not really in a, petition, in, a, in a position as a board to consider what actions we might want to take until after we hear a presentation from Megan on the specifications for the 2018 fishing year, uh, where we get into the issue of the state water subcomponents and uh, what this board would like to do regarding those components and restraining catch further if indeed that is the desire of the board. So with that said, uh, we'll turn to Megan, and she'll now give us her presentation uh, specific to those winter flounder specifications uh, and the overview of them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So at its December meeting, the New England Council approved Framework 57, which included the ACLs for Gulf of Maine and the Southern New England slash Mid-Atlantic winter flounder stocks. Um, and the largest change did occur in that Gulf of Maine stock where the ACL was significantly reduced. So in the Gulf of Maine, the 2018 AT total ACL is 428 metric tons, which is a 348 metric ton decrease from the previous year. The state water subcomponent is 67 metric tons, which is a 55 metric ton decrease from the previous year. And just for some context, the 2016 state water's total catch was 100.9 metric tons. And this is of concern since this is significantly above the 2018 state water subcomponent of 67. So this suggests that the board may need to consider different management tools or measures for this reduced subcomponent. In Southern New England and Mid-Atlantic, the 2018 total ACL is 700 metric tons, which is a 49 metric ton decrease from the previous year. The state water subcomponent is 73 metric tons, which is actually a slight increase, and this is because the percentage associated with that state water subcomponent increased from 9% to 10%. And then for context, the 2016 state waters catch was 64.7 metric tons. So that is below what the 2018 state water subcomponent is. So given the board may need to consider changes specifically to those Gulf of Maine management measures, um, this slide is a quick review of the tools that the board can adjust through board action, and this is under addendum three. So for commercial measures, the board can adjust the size limit, the season, area closures, a trip limit, or some sort of trigger for a trip limit. So that would uh, trigger a reduction in the trip limit when a certain percentage of the state water sub subcomponent is reached. For the recreational measures, the board can change the size, size limit, the bag limit, and the season. And then this is a review of our current Gulf of Maine, Southern New England slash Mid-Atlantic regulations. Um, these have been in effect since 2014. And if no action is taken by the board, then these are the management measures that will roll over into 2018. Um, so there's a 500 pound commercial trip limit in Gulf of Maine and an eight fish bag limit for the recreational fishery. In southern New England, it's a 50-pound commercial trip limit and a two-fish recreational fish limit, and those all come with 12-inch size limits. And we'll just leave this up here for the discussion. As a reminder, uh, in your binder, or maybe on the, on the table, there's a briefing document showing the specifications for the 2018 fishing year. It's a one-pager, and it has the information that uh, Megan just presented. So 
you can reference that to uh, TE's discussion as to uh, what the board would like to do in response to the presentation given by Megan. Any, any questions of Megan regarding what she has presented? All right. Uh, no action would mean status quo for uh, the upcoming fishing year, which begins May 1, 2018. We correspond to the federal fishing year, May 1 through April. So that's what status quo would uh, result in, as shown in that, uh, that one pager. I'll just call attention to one important point made by, by Megan, and that is for the Gulf of Maine stock, the state water subcomponent is now 67 metric tons. This is what is essentially set aside for the states in hopes by the council that the states will do whatever is possible to restrain the catch to that particular number. It's not an allocation, it's a set aside, expected catch inside state waters. So 67 uh, metric tons, that's a decrease from 122 metric tons the previous fishing year. Of note, and I'll highlight this because it's relevant, 2016 total catch, we don't have 2017, but 2016 total catch in state waters was about 101 metric tons. So about 101 metric tons in 2016. The subcomponent for 2018 is 67 metric tons. So that's about a one-third reduction in the amount of, uh, of catch in 2016 to get us, presumably, to that 2018 state water subcomponent, once again, for the Gulf of Maine. I'm not speaking of southern New England, mid-Atlantic. So that's, uh, that's the information we have before us. And the question of the board is, uh, do you care to take any specific action in response to these findings and, and what the council has prescribed as, as subcomponents? Uh, is there a need to consult the technical committee regarding what sorts of options might be available to get that necessary reduction? Uh, any thoughts? Bob Bloom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rhode Island has developed a memo that is, has been presented to the board. It, it came out late last week, so I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to read it. But the upshot is that we would like the technical committee to uh, evaluate the 50-pound uh, possession limit uh, in, in the southern New England mid-Atlantic region uh, with a view to considering an aggregate weekly limit uh, as an alternative approach. And, and the memo identifies uh, two or three different options for how that could be done. Uh, uh, and it calls attention to the fact that with that 50-pound possession limit, uh, bycatch and discard mortality is a significant issue and could well be addressed by uh, an aggregate program. So uh, th it, there hasn't been a lot of analysis done on it yet, and we would respectfully request through the board that the technical committee take a look at the options that have been presented. And the, uh, I know the Division of Marine Fisheries in Rhode Island is, is prepared to offer additional analytic support to that uh, approach. So it would be our preference to either await final decision on specifications until that analysis is completed and presented back to the board for review, or potentially consider that as a conservation equivalency approach uh, under the current uh, specifications. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read something into what you just said, and that is, it seems that you do not believe that this board needs to take any specific action to reduce uh, States waters catch recreational or commercial of southern New England mid-Atlantic flounder that you believe it should be status quo and then to go beyond that you're looking for a technical committee review of, uh, of an aggregate landing limit as opposed to uh, a, a daily limit. Is, is that a, am I properly characterizing what you've concluded and what you are recommending? The answer is yes. All right. I'll hold off on it. David Borden. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, are you at the point uh, in the meeting where you just want general comments or try to try to answer the question you asked? I'm certainly willing to take general comments. Uh, you know, Bob jumped ahead a little bit, and that's fine. But, uh, David, what do you have to offer? Okay. So um, it, just a couple of observations here. We got a rebuilding deadline of 2023. My memory serves me correctly. This is the second rebuilding timeline we've had for this stock. 
uh, and, and uh, you know, and listening to Paul's presentation, and thank you for the presentation, it was excellent. Uh, it, I, I keep coming back to the same point, that we have a disconnect between the interstate fishery management plan and the council plan. The, council, the interstate plan, particularly in southern New England and in the mid-Atlantic, is a super restrictive plan. I mean, the, the allowances are 50 pounds and 38 fish. Uh, and I, I personally think that that is justified. In other words, the status of the stock uh, justifies that position. But where I really suffer, my, the logic breaks down, at least in my own mind, is when I think about the federal waters component of this stock, uh, where they have a different operating system. The fishermen are allowed to target the stock, as long as they have a, a catch allowance for the stock, there is targeting. And uh, in listening to Paul's presentation, at least with Southern New England, we're in this mode where the recruitment, uh, and I wrote a note to myself, the recruitment uh, has uh, increased every year, I think, since 2012. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're in this mode where so we've got the SSB is going down, I think, and the recruitment levels are going up. Uh, and we've got this disconnect between the two regulatory uh, systems. So nature is actually helping us out because the recruitment values are, are going up. So I mean, my thinking keeps coming back to this. Are these two management approaches compatible? And I think my answer to that is they are not, because one allows targeting, and the other one is a, a bycatch system, at least in, in southern New England. So I, I, we, we need a process to reconcile these differences, uh, from, at least from my perspective. I don't know whether anybody else agrees with that, but I think these two management strategies are incompatible. Any further comments? Uh, uh, Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, in, in regards to the Gulf of Maine, I'm not sure I'm ready to suggest any management changes without further technical uh, guidance on this. I know from uh, looking at our own Maine, New Hampshire trial survey data, we're not seeing any uh, any larger fish. It was certainly bared, uh, shown in, in the presentation here today. Um, creel surveys are showing we're not interacting with a lot of fish uh, on the majority of the coast of Maine. Um, so from a rec fish measure perspective, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out how we would um, you know, w we probably could make changes within the state of Maine rules and not have any impact of the fishery if we're not I interacting with them. So um, w while that may be a token uh, gesture to make a change, if it doesn't have any um, any appreciable difference in what's going to be landed, then I'm, I'm having a hard time making a determination on how we should make management changes at this time. Doug. So, um, a couple comments. One, we've sort of been bop, jumping back and forth between southern New England and, and uh, Gulf of Maine. And, and just to one of David's points about directed fishery, my, my question is, is, you know, under the, just as a comment more, is to keep in mind that these, uh, there are allocations for winter flounder in, in southern New England, but are they low enough, uh, are they high enough uh, that they could actually be targeting. I mean, we have uh, low AC, uh, low allocations up in the Gulf of Maine for certain uh, fisheries like yellowtail that you just you can't target the fish. You ha you have to use it as a bycatch in trying to target other things. So just we need to be careful about saying that everybody's targeting. There may be I don't know enough about enough about the Southern New England fishery. So that's my comment on southern New England. Um, as far as Gulf of Maine, um, I, we had uh, a, uh, with this assessment, is we, our current ACL is about 55 percent about what it, what it was uh, in the previous year. And the, more importantly, the state subcomponent is also now 55 percent of it. 
And uh, given that the commercial um, landings are, are, you know, roughly about 85 percent of that, I think we've got to look at taking some action a little bit quicker, because uh, otherwise, but if we waited till um, May to take action, uh, there could, and by the time those new measures got in place to try and constrain the, su the state water subcomponent, it could be too late to stay at least within it. And obviously, if you go over in the state water subcomponent, you're going to be affecting um, the the, the um, uh, federal permitted vessels are the ones that are going to be uh, paying the accountability measures, not the state waters. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to throw up a motion to see if um, we might be able to lower the trip limit on the commercial fishery. And my motion is to uh, move to uh, reduce the trip limit on Gulf of Maine um, state waters um, commercial vessels down to 250 pounds per day. Is there a second to the motion? Is there a second to the motion? Okay, I, I, I see none. So okay. there, there is no motion on the floor. Uh, I'll, make a, I'll make a suggestion um, in the interest of time. And the, the suggestion is this, that in looking at the southern New England mid-Atlantic stock in the state water subcomponent that has been established for 2018, I see that it's 73 metric tons. 2016 total catch in state waters was 64.7 metric tons. Now that would be, again, only for 2016, not 17, and that represents commercial catch as well as recreational take. And therein lies the disconnect that David Borden has highlighted, that unlike Gulf of Maine cod, where there's a recreational fishery allocation and a commercial uh, for winter flounder, there is none. Winter flounder, really, management of winter flounder was initiated in a major way by ASMFC, by this board. The council eventually caught up, and now we're dealing with subcomponents and, and the, the need to try to live within those subcomponents. So I'm suggesting to you that the data before us now suggests no action is needed for Southern New England Mid-Atlantic beyond, for example, what was just offered up by Bob Lou regarding a weekly limit. For the Gulf of Maine cod stock, however, it's a slightly different situation. Uh, as already highlighted by Doug, that we have uh, established for us by federal action a state water subcomponent of 67 metric tons. And the catch, in 2016, recreational as well as commercial was about 101 metric tons. So if we take no action, someone is going to assume, perhaps the New England Council, that in 2018, May 1 through April 2019, uh, we will, that is the states in the Gulf of Maine, will take far more than the state waters subcomponent, and that will have implications for federal waters fishermen. Uh, so, um, I'll ask, uh, is, does the board believe that there is a need for us to take action at this time relative to that state water subcomponent? Uh, if not, do, you, do we need to have some tactical committee work to assist us in that regard to determine what we might want to consider for uh, the next fishing year, recognizing it's February and the next meeting is in May. Uh, Richie. Um, if you could educate me, Mr. Chair, um, if we take no action and if we over harvest our component, what, what are the consequences? I believe that, well, I'll turn to, uh, to Doug to assist me in this regard or anybody else on the council, but uh, I believe that the federal waters fishermen, the federally permitted fishermen, would pay the price for whatever is caught in state waters that brings the total take above the, the ACL. So that would likely result in, um, I'm just somewhat, I'm an assumption, 
uh, further restrictions on federal waters, federal, federally permitted fishermen uh, in the, the coming fishing year. I think I've, I've got that right. Uh, if, if Paul? Um, that is true if the, on the federal side they catch their allocation. Now for the Gulf of Maine stock, they've been way under. So it's not clear. I mean, if you look at the catch performance plot, you can see that they haven't come anywhere close to the total ABC. Thank you, Paul. Very important point. So uh, if indeed federal water, if catch by federally permitted fishermen is falling far short of what's been established for them as allowable catch, then if we go over the, if the states go over the Gulf of Maine subcomponent, there really is no consequence for the federally permitted fishermen because we're not going over the, the, the ACL. All right, uh, Colleen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Pat alluded earlier that availability was an issue. Do we have an idea what the 2017 landings are estimated to be? Is it likely that they're lower than 2016 or the same? Uh, we don't have the information in hand. My assumption is that the catch continues to be low because of uh, lack of resource, lack of availability, and also other measures that are in place that are restraining the federal waters fishermen. David Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question, and then maybe a comment. What, could somebody describe to me the process that was followed to uh, assign a subwater, a, a state water subcomponent, either for the Gulf of Maine or Southern New England? Paul? Well, um, can I show a slide, actually? It's second to last in that presentation. So when the, the PDT tries to estimate the state subcomponent every time we do the specs. Now, we don't know what the regs coming out of this body is, but we try to get an estimate of what that catch is. So. What we've been doing is trying to use the three-year average of the estimated state subcomponent catch, is that three-year average, and try to match that three-year average. Not up there. So here in the middle column, you can see the, the catch, total catch es estimate for the state subcomponent over time from 2010 to 2016. That's both the commercial and recreational state subcomponent. Um, on the left are the ABCs, and the PDT basically tries to develop a percentage of that ABC needed to match the three-year average, the, the latest three-year average of that catch. Now, for Southern New England, that three-year average was used in the specs. For the Gulf of Maine, the PDT estimated the 22% that was not used. The, the council went, used the 15% the that was in the past, and that's why there's a reduction now in that state subcomponent. David, if I might, uh, I guess the comment, if I understand the mathematics here is, and I'll use a hypothetical. If uh, states uh, in the southern New England, mid-Atlantic area reduce their catch uh, to zero, then the consequence would be that the uh, federal waters um, component would increase. Is that correct? Yeah, whatever we put in the specs, it has a direct effect on the federal component. So whatever you put in for the subcomponent. Okay, but it, the, it goes back to the question that Richie White asked, what's the consequence? And there are, I think there are consequences here. If, if the states 
continue to, to reduce their state waters catch. This wasn't a nego uh, two points. This was not a negotiated sharing arrangement between the commission and the federal partners uh, on on this, and it probably should have have been. Uh, and the second point is that if the consequence is that the more restricted the states are, then that liberalizes the uh, catches for federal waters. Just uh, it, it's inconse inconsistent with the logic of we want to rebuild stock. Uh, for those board members who are new to these sorts of discussions, uh, winter flounder is a, a unique species in terms of it being the only ground fish species that ASMFC manages cooperatively with the New England Fishery Management Council. Uh, all other ground fish species are the New England Council's purview. Obviously, the Mid-Atlantic Council has some input to those discussions, and individual states are supposed to, on cod, for example, on haddock, for example, with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts being the excellent example, uh, being uh, obliged to seriously restrain catches in state waters by non-federal permit holders so that we can keep to the subcomponents uh, that have been set aside for expected state waters catch. And if we don't live with those subcomponents and the consequences are some additional restriction on federally permitted fishermen. But in this particular case, again, it's this unique situation for, for winter flounder. And now well, I think this might be the first meeting where the board is obliged to consider uh, some response. And at this point in time, I don't see anyone willing to make a motion that uh, would reflect a change in the approach or the change in the measures for 2018. That could, might be mistaken. Uh, Pat. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're not mistaken as it pertains to anybody making a motion, um, but I think David brings up an excellent point. Uh, in a couple of days at the policy um, board meeting, we're going to be discussing the issues of, about um, uh, herring as it relates to uh, additional conversations with the council um, uh, and discussing our mutual goals for that species. And I think uh, in, in having a conversation over lunch with uh, Mr. Stockwell, I, I think he brought up an excellent point that it's not those conversations aren't going to be just about uh, herring. I think they're going to need to expand to other species, such as winter flounder, so we can talk about what our mutual goals are. And I think that's going to be it, it, every bit as important and during those conversations as the herring uh, conversations will be. So I, I think moving in that direction, maintaining status quo right now, having those conversations with the council, determining what their mutual goals are, and then coming back at a subsequent meeting to try to figure out where we're going to go from here will be uh, very important. All right, thank you, Pat. Uh, Pat has offered up a suggested path forward. Uh, if there are no board members uh, uh, motivated to make a motion regarding a change in the winter flounder specifications for 2018 at this meeting, uh, we'll, we'll go on to another issue, which is the issue that was uh, raised by Bob Ballou. Bob, uh, I'll paraphrase a bit. I believe you're, you're asking the board to request that the technical committee uh, examine, uh, analyze the suggestion that the state of Rhode Island has offered up regarding uh, aggregate limits for winter flounder as opposed to individual trip limits. Uh, am, I, am I properly characterizing? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there's no objection from the board, uh, the memo prepared by Bob and his staff uh, will be forwarded to the plan development team, to the technical committee for, uh, for its review in order for us to better assess whether or not that strategy will um, maybe be conservation neutral or catch neutral. Uh, in other words, see if how, how that particular approach would relate to our keeping to the uh, state waters well, actually, it wouldn't be state water subcomponent. This is just a. All right. All right. So this would be just a, a, a suggestion to move it to the technical committee for an evaluation as to whether the aggregate weekly aggregate weekly limit um, uh, is warranted. Okay. 
That's fair enough, and I think certainly relating it back to the, the uh, state water subcomponent is, is relevant as well. Uh, I'm not sure that's the primary charge, but I, I think it, uh, to your point, I think it's, it's a combination of, of the two things that you just mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree that it is relevant, especially since it's possible that a weekly aggregate limit could result in more directed fishing on, on uh, southern New England mid-Atlantic winter flounder. And if indeed it does, that does provide for more directed fishing. We need to know to what extent might that occur and what are the implications of that directed fishing, increased directed fishing, specific for the state waters uh, uh, subcomponents. Okay. Colleen, did you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Uh, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, the point of an aggregate is to avoid discards. Um, that, that's the key to success there. Uh, instead of trying to go out and catch 50 pounds every day, seven days a week, and discard what you, whatever you catch over 50 pounds, if you have an aggregate and it, you know maybe it's 250 pounds instead of 350, you would actually reduce discards, which is the whole benefit to an aggregate program. And that's what we're hoping the TC is going to tell us. So uh, it may increase effort on, on an individual basis per day, but I think overall it will decrease discards, which is to our advantage. So that's the point of it. Okay, thank you, Eric, for that, that clarification. That's quite true, uh, impact on discarding. Um, so that will be another element of the technical committee review. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I support um, Rhode Island's proposal for an aggregate um, uh, trip limit. And I would just, I just want to make it clear in our request to the technical committee that, that they analyze this relative to um, any and all states, rel you know, for the southern New England, mid-Atlantic um, winter flounder stock and not just Rhode Island, because there may be other states that would like to uh, participate in this as well. Yeah, Emerson, my, my uh, assumption would be that that's the case, not just for Rhode Island. Anyone wanted to take advantage of it, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it might be a heavy lift for the technical committee, but it's certainly worth uh, their uh, examining it. Yeah. All right. Um, with that said, and if there are no other suggestions, comments, motions specific for the specification process for 2018, and I don't believe there are, uh, Megan? So just to clarify, so I understand how the board is intending to move forward for Gulf of Maine. What I'm hearing is maintain status quo and, and talk about mutual goals with the New England Council. Is the intent to have that conversation between now and May so that in May this board reconvenes to reconsider specifications or um, the board is comfortable at this point maintaining current specifications for 2018? My assumption is that uh, at this point in time, we are comfortable with specifications for 2018 and work needs to be done between uh, ASMFC leadership and the, uh, and the New England Council to um, um, begin those discussions, hopefully before May, so that we'll be in a far better position in May as a board to uh, possibly take some action. All right, let's go on to the next uh, agenda item, which is the fishery management plan review. Uh, once again, we turn to Megan for her overview. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will keep this brief because we've discussed a lot of components of this today. Um, so Jess, I'm just gonna skip three slides to the status of fishery. I think we've discussed status of the stock enough today. Um, but in terms of status of the fishery, um, commercial and recreational landings have declined since the 1980s. Specifically, commercial landings peaked at around 40.3 million pounds in 1981, but have generally declined throughout the 90s and 2000s. Uh, in 2016, commercial landings were 2.6 million pounds, with the majority of this, about 80%, taken in Massachusetts. Recreational harvest in 2016 was just over 100,000 pounds and represents a significant decrease from the 16.4 million pounds that were caught in 1982. And between 2013 and 2016, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York comprised the majority of the recreational landings. 
I'm going to, again, skip this slide here. I think we've talked about the commercial measures and recreational measures uh, already. So one of the planned specific requirements for winter flounder is that under Amendment 1, the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New York are required to continue annual surveys of juvenile recruitment to develop an annual uh, juvenile abundance, abundance index for winter flounder. In addition, the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Jersey are required to conduct annual surveys to develop an index of spawning stock biomass, and all of these states have continued to meet this monitoring requirement. So all states are in compliance with the FMP and addenda. There were no requests for de minimis status this year, so the PRT is recommending that the board approve the 2017 FMP review and state compliance reports. Any questions of Megan? Okay, if not, uh, do I hear a uh, motion to accept the 2018 FMP review and state compliance reports? Motion made by uh, Doug Grout, uh, is there a second? Second by uh, um, Colleen. Jeannie, Jeannie, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there any objection to the motion? I see none, therefore the uh, motion is approved. Uh, next would be, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. The uh, AP committee membership, as noted, in the uh, in the briefing material, we have uh, an AP committee membership that has not been updated recently, and as noted by staff, attendance on conference calls has been low. So we've been asked as individual states to review our membership and denominate a new AP member if the position is vacant, and I assume for some states the position uh, is vacant or if the current member is not actively participating, that person has been contacted and questions have been asked, why not? Are you still willing to be a, an, an, an AP committee member? Uh, are, any, uh, are any states in the position now to offer up some names for membership uh, on the advisory panel? Uh, if not, uh, please get those names to uh, Megan as soon as possible. I know Massachusetts has to do that, and we haven't yet come up with uh, someone to, to fill, the, fill the vacancy. So we'll be submitting a name to, uh, to Megan uh, fairly soon, or names to Megan fairly soon. So uh, please, uh, if you haven't already done so, take a look at that membership. And in light of the discussion we've already had, and in light of the fact that uh, there may be some change in the way in which this board interacts with the New England Council, and how we have uh, cooperative and collaborative management with the council. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be even more important to have uh, our advisory panel uh, fully, you know, fully staffed. So please do that. Uh, I guess I jumped ahead a little bit, Megan. You were going to give a presentation on this, or no? Okay, good. No, All right, great. good. <laughs> is uh, is there any other business to bring before the board? Mm -hmm. All right, I see none. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion made by uh, Ray Kane. And a second? All right, by uh, Pat Kelleherb. Uh, with no objection, the, the meeting is adjourned.